All right, well, good evening. <clears throat> Just kind of to give you, uh, as you know, one of the uh, requirements of the state of uh, Michigan is a law to adopt a balanced budget by July 1st. Um, so what I've got here is just the timeline we've been on, a very typical timeline for you, but the uh, board workshop um, begins back in April where we went through some of the general ideas for the budget, where we thought we might be going with the state and with our own uh, local. And then where we're at tonight is the proposed 17-18 uh, budget, which I'm about to show you the board and the public hearing that you will hold right afterwards. And then you will come back, as it says up here, um, to take board action on the 26th. You'll adopt the 17-18 budget. Then you'll also approve the final 16-17 budget adjustment, which will vary again when they do the audit. But as you know, we have to start one budget before the other one's finished. And so there's a lot of estimations as you go there, especially for a district our size. There's a, a lot of money still out there. And while we work on it, we still get people that will say they're going to spend something that they don't quite spend, which is a good thing. But um, so the numbers come in. So that's kind of where we're heading. I always like to remind everybody that unlike budgets, when people think of them at home or in a business, it's not advisory when you're talking about a public school budget. It is really just an accounting of both the source and how we're using public funds. And so that's why we do adjustments to match what's going on as we go over time. So it gives us some guidelines, absolutely. But it's uh, as a public entity, we're really showing the public how we use the money that's given to us from various um, one of the most important things that we do in this uh, budget meeting, or the first budget, is we talk about the millage rates. And we establish those. And you know, later in our board packet, we have to establish those with the city of Midland because they issue a summer tax, and they need to know how much to issue that. Um, pretty standard millage rates here. You, you, the first one is 18 mils on the non-homestead. That's the standard one voted oh, two or three years ago now. It's good for 10 years. It's the most that you can levy. It's, it's basically what every district in the state does on that. Homestead. The second one is the hold harmless millage. It's calculated every year. So this year it works out to be 1.7100. Um, it's up slightly, about 0 0.0286, uh, six actually, to be exactly on. Um, the way that's calculated is way back when, when they first gave us a uh, hold harmless district, they established the amount of money that you could raise per student. It's uh, $415.31. Back then, it took five mils, actually more than five mils, to raise that amount of money. Uh, so over time, you can never raise any more. So depending on where the taxable value is and how many students we have, that's going to change this millage year after year after year. Well, since neither of those are exact sciences when we're setting it right now, they also allow the following year for you to adjust it. If you levy too high one year, you got to take it down the next. If you didn't levy enough, you take it up. Typically, that's what happens. Uh, in this case, maybe we had a few more students than we thought. The other thing that we're starting to notice is we're getting bigger adjustments because the other part that's in there is the uh, personal property tax exemption. You lose that. Now, it's made up through the state, but you have to put that into your calculations where the millage rate should go. I wish I could tell you that's a simple process, but you got to get all that information from the county. And then on top of it, especially in a district like Midland, we have to go back and they have to subtract out Renaissance zones, IFTs, all. We offer a lot of things out there that, as far as the district, um, even at the county level, it's really tough to figure out in time for this meeting. So what you can do is they give you the number. You know how much personal property tax that you're losing. And we put that in there. But then the following year, we're going to have to adjust for those things that came in and out. So we're seeing slightly bigger adjustments as we go. doesn't affect anything. We're following the rules. It's just we're just seeing bigger adjustments either way because of the personal property tax. Uh, the other part is for our bond. And if you remember when we started, I know I'll get this one, 2.92 was the very first one. Last year was 2.88, and now we're down to 2.72. We arrive at that by sending all our information in to our bond advisor, financial advisor, which uh, uh, is now with PFM. It used to be started by the same people. We talked to the exact same people, just different company. And they look at all our taxable value, where it's going, et cetera, and set that. The reason it's going down, a lot of people think it's in terms of taxable value going up. In actuality, it's um, Taxable value, and when they first start, they project the bond out over time. Really, they knew personal property tax was coming out of our taxable value back in 2015, and they just predicted it would drop our taxable value by bigger increments when they first started. So I think the first year they thought we were going to drop by 13% taxable value, and the county only dropped by 8. 
And so this, this I think last year they were predicting four, but this year it's down by one. So yeah, it does mean some of the real property is going up a little bit, um, but it just means that it's hard to predict a bond out 15, 20, 25 years. And so we send it every year, um, right in uh, mid-May, and it goes back pretty quickly, and they tell us what we should be levying to do that. We don't want to over-levy. We want to get in that situation. Of course, you don't want to under-levy. So that's where we stand today. State funding is interesting this year because unlike the previous years that I've done this, uh, the state aid budget is not settled. Some years it's not quite been settled, but we knew where they were going. Um, the proposed the closure of the MIPSERS the retirement system to new teachers, if you've read anything about that, appeared to be, I'm going to say appeared to be, a stumbling block between the governor and the legislature. Um, actually, within, and I mentioned the last part there in the last five days, it appears that both the budget and the MIPSERS ideas coming to a compromise someplace. So literally, while they worked on the compromise for the retirement system, which is, um, in essence, right now, there's a pension system, there's a hybrid pension system for any new teacher since 2010, where it's partially a pension, it's partially an investment, like in a 403B or 401K, et cetera. Um, what the legislature's proposing on one side is that everybody gets closed out, you go to 401K plans, that's all you get. The governor's not so sure that's the way it should go, kind of believes in the hybrid plan, thinks it'll pay off in the long run and it'll be there faster. It's a difference of opinion and they both have uh, people on both sides with numbers. Some of their own fiscal agencies will say, you just extended this longer, you've got some big money because you have to then uh, pay up the system, if you will, so it's solvent because now you get no one else coming to the pension system to support those that are in the pension system. So they've debated about what's the right thing to do. Here's they're heading towards a compromise. Maybe one that encourages more people to go to the 401k retirement and less of the pension, but the pension would still be there. Uh, but that part's not been determined, and nor in some ways does that affect us. It affected us because they held up the budget. But they also sat down at the same time and started to uh, head towards, you know, some kind of, I don't want to call it a compromise, but agreement on where we should be with the budget. So the main difference, if you remember back when I did this in April, was basically are we going to get 50? 2x formula, 50 and 100 for districts, was it going to be 100 for everybody, which was the House version, and then there was the Senate version, which was like $88 and $166, and they were going to take some of the retirement funds that they give the district away, which wouldn't have been good for us. And the other question was, how much of the 31A at-risk money would we get? Okay, so those are the parts there. So it's not finalized, but we do have some agreement. So when you look at the budget and you look at the revenue side, I'll start there. Here are the assumptions that we did in putting together the budget. Um, it seems clear to us that the 2x formula is going to be in there. And it appears that it will be $60 per student. Okay? That brings us up to a foundation allowance, if you will, of $8,411. Because the other thing they did is it appears they're going to leave in. You have to remember a year ago, uh, they had to put a, a little extra money in, in a lot of the old harmless districts because, uh, because of inflation. We weren't going to get any kind of an increase a year ago. So they put in an extra $50, I think it was $51, for um, each of those districts. They left that in the foundation. That's a good thing, because they could have pulled that back out, mm -hmm. given it 60, taken away 51, and it wouldn't be very far ahead. So right now it looks like they're going to be there. The latest projections for 31A month is about $525,000 that we're getting. Now, you're not going to see it in your original budget, because this is a, an expense that's have to equal revenue. And um, to put it in this, right now I'd be putting in a line of revenue for it, and I'd just be putting in an expense line that really didn't mean anything to you. Um, the expenses, um, and, and Brian will work on that, Mike will work on that, I guess we all will. Uh, there are some things that could help us on the general fund side, I'm not going to say a fortune, but there are also some things that will help us meet uh, some of the requirements coming, like in literacy, uh, with literacy coaches, so there are some things that we won't have to spend general fund money on. But we'll bring that at adjustment time, we'll keep you informed as we go. But it really didn't make any sense to put that in there now when we don't know how it's going to be spent. And to be honest, um, you know, that, that's one thing that could be fluid enough that it could change enough. And as you remember, it ranged from 1.7 million, I think, on the proposals to 100,000. So somewhere in between, but I don't think we should put that in the budget to worry about it just at this point in time. Because again, equal expenses to the revenue that go together. You can carry some money over, so don't worry. Uh, we don't get it, the state delays on us a little bit, we'll still have that money, it's just when we can use that. And the other thing that they're all pretty clear on is we're going to maintain the MIPSERS cost offsets. 
Um, they're not going to take anything out of that. It appears to be there. And I don't know, if, I know I've explained it numerous times, but just again, the retirement system is being supported with the state payment that comes to us, and then we turn around and give it right back to them. And it does two things. It puts a cap on top of it, and then they're kind of paying down a little bit of the difference. So the 147A pays down some of it. 147C puts a cap on it. Um, I think the 147C is using that touchable. They kind of know they're going to keep doing that. Uh, but the 147A, that's always like that little carrot. That goes up. If they don't fund that, that's always going to mean more dollars out of the district's pocket someplace. So support. So we're capped right now. I think it's 25. It's coming years like 25.96 is the highest we would pay for anybody. Without it, you'd be in the you know, 37, 38, depending on, on, on who would win and which part they are. There's seven or eight different ways we can do that. Some of the assumptions for MPS then. Um, we're projecting from our consultants and everything that we know, and enrollment drop about 63 students. Um, it's a good thing if I'm wrong on that to the high side. In other words, you, you, it wouldn't hurt your feelings if I came back next year and said we have the same number of students in the district. Hmm. That's a very good thing. And it is one of the fastest ways to turn our district around financially. No question. Um, we're talking about a blended count of 7629. Um, we do know, and I just listed a few of the grants that are coming out of there, so you know why the revenue is dropping just a little bit. The number of students will be the biggest effect on it. Um, reductions in federal programs, 325,000, as you've heard, the title funds and what's going on with the federal government, those are fluctuating. And it looks like the state's saying we're going to get less of both. And the initial allowed to show that. You'll also see a reduction on the expense side, too, because if you don't take in federal dollars, it doesn't go out on the other side. Um, we always, too, with ESA and special education, how much it's costing, it's, it's varying. And this coming year, it looks like we would receive about $161,000 less than we had in the past. Uh, the TRIG technology grants are the ones that have been there, especially as the state turned over to uh, statewide testing on, on computers. Uh, there was quite a bit of money out there. And it's, it's going away now, so we spent the last of it. Um, it's helped a tremendous amount of time. One of the ways we are getting more money through the ESA is the IDA flow through money. We, for a long time, have provided parochial services. It's not the same as what we've tried if it came to MPS, but we will mainly in the area of speech, but it can be any special education services. Um, we provide those services because those parochial schools are in our school district. Um, but we were kind of got looking here, not myself, Lori Holderby's here too, before I forget to. A lot of people going and making a budget. Uh, not me just sitting there and doing that. Lori does the, all the legwork. Uh, the business people and everybody that we have to go to to get budget numbers from. It's kind of important that they all pull together here. But Lori and I started looking at this going, we think we should be getting some money from the ESA. We're not sure why we're doing this, and either why they're not doing it or why not, we're not getting any money for it. Not a private that way. So we've been working with them, and uh, they are flowing through money. It's federal money. It's meant to serve the parochials. It's a fortunate share question that they're getting an equal amount. And so we're just going to finally get paid for those services. It doesn't reimburse us directly. That's not what we're asking for. There was a fortunate share that should come through. Looks like going forward, we'll retain that just because we have the capacity, and we approached the ESA about them taking it over. Um, there are little parts that they would have a hard time filling. Um, and so we think it might be best for us to keep managing like we have and just have them blow the money through for this. So the income uh, will never fully cover everything you do, but it's better than we've been for a while. So I wanted to show you the enrollment because you often want to see the trends because when we talk about it, it's such a big factor in what we do. And so as you look at this one, this just kind of shows you the breakdown. Uh, 15, 16 through 17, 18 estimates. And the other thing I'd point out to you, we typically, I typically leave 8, 9 up there because that's the last year of 20J money. So we had quite a few students. We were getting uh, 290 some dollars more per student each time. Um, that was the kind of the heyday of times. And when it went away, it kind of gives you where to compare it to. But just so you know, you can see how the elementary versus secondary versus special ed uh, breakdown goes. And of course, don't forget, we get total numbers, but then it has to be blended over time. Remember, they measure 10% from the February before and 90%. You get partials, and there's a whole bunch that goes into accounting people around here. But just so you can see, uh, it's kind of interesting. The elementary appears to have stabilized, or if not grown a little bit. That could be part of stuff we're doing, bond, et cetera, and programming. And uh, as we knew, that bubble of birth has to kind of go down at the secondary level. And you're just seeing it's not dramatic, because we get feed-ins from other programs for example, that ended in grade. So we're just getting some of those successes. Just to give you an idea, if you really want to see a trend line, I think that's the one that showed it. And I think I put that in the board packets too. But 
it's really been over that last little bit there as you look at it that we've, uh, I think 13, 14 was when I was here at Mike at the Levy. Because that was when, <laughs> that last line that kind of went way down. We lost <clears throat> like 150 more students, uh, I think, that Lynn had projected at the time. And since that time, it's flattened itself out considerably. And that's made a difference in where we stand at. Um, you could put a birth rate in Midland County on there, and uh, it, it, it would match, you know, pretty perfectly the same shape of the curve on that graph. It's just there's, there's less kids out there, and there's more competition for those kids, but there's just less to grab. Um, that's the one thing when we work with the consultant, feels that we're just grabbing. If you take the birth rate, just what percent are you getting in kindergarten? It's gone up. Now, it's, I'm not telling you it's like 10% up. It's more like 34% up from what we were. So it might have been down around 59. It's, 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 it's a good thing, but it's just uh, this is how the per pupil foundation allowance goes. I would just tell you it will fluctuate depending on how much the local brings in. You see that 415, 31 from the whole harmless right across. You can't change that. This is all per pupil, by the way. The local millage will depend on the taxable value of the non homestead. Okay? So if it goes up and you see the percentage go up, then the state aid payment is going to go down because there's only so much to get there. That's why we always tell people, too, if the whole harmless millage would ever vote it down. Uh, that's our problem. The state doesn't make that up. That's the one thing that is above and beyond. So uh, they would match the other ones. And it just varies over time. In fact, you can see there back in 8 9 that that 20 J payment that uh, Governor Granholm had taken away was uh, $293 a student. So you get some idea of where we were. So, general fund, we're looking at 79000 uh, $79 million. Um, and uh, so, Seventy-nine million one hundred twenty-eight thousand nine hundred fourteen dollars. You get the chance to see where those funds are coming from. Pretty consistent with uh, budgets you've seen in the past as for where the breakdown is coming from, state versus local, etc. And I guess the only other thing I would say there is that it's down about nine hundred thousand, roughly nine fifty, from where it was uh, this year from the uh, March budget just, which was the last time that we created. So that's where we stand right there. Okay, the expenditure side. Um, we keep using our balance, our budget. It seems to be working. It's the process of maintaining uh, building and department expenditures close to the level they were at for 16, 17. Actually, close to the level they were at 15, 16. Actually, close to the level they were at 14, 15. Since we started this, it's more of a process. It, it's just our terminology for process of you come in and tell us not what you had last year, but <laughs> what do you need and what do you need for this year. You know, it doesn't make us the favorite people at that time of year, um, but it is a good question. It has helped us maintain the supply side of our of our um, budget. Uh, we are ending some of our employee concessions from the past two years. You remember uh, people that have been on the board for a while. We did ask for concessionary packages from all our employee groups, and that's coming to an end. So we do have some payments, one-time budget surplus protection stipends. So the states the steps have been reinstated. And Whenever the steps come back in, um, it's no fault of anybody. There's just a lot of people there waiting to step. And so that makes a difference in how much money we have going out at that point in time. Um, as you know, as part of this, I'm pretty pleased with the fact that uh, we actually have every employee group uh, settled. We got it done way early this time. Um, we had approximately 1% salary increase for employees. It kind of went along with the reduced uh, budget surplus protection <coughs> stipend. That was part of the deal. We do have an increase in medical premiums of 8%. Um, remember, we lost some of the runoff costs, too, so it's kind of a little bit of a trade-off. Um, we are decreasing, not this year, but it will happen in January, um, the district's funding of the health savings accounts. Um, you know, we raised uh, the, uh, the individual's uh, contribution to their health savings account. In other words, uh, the deductibles are like 100 to 200 less than we funded a year ago. We know we have to go there because no matter what you do, if the health keeps increasing, we have to find ways to keep under for our employees' sake, too, the hard cap. Because the state does limit how high we can spend, so it's important we find affordable health plans that are good for our employees but don't violate it. Because once you go over it, people are on the hook for the full amount of whatever you go over. So it's important we find plans to work. There's a reduction in that federal programming, matches the revenues. And then staffing patterns, it's kind of a process. I can explain it to you totally at times, but we're always looking at evaluating and it can be the time of year, it can be that year, it can be at the 
end of year where we sit there and say, okay, what did we just do? Is that good, bad, and different? So we always try to analyze, I guess is the best way I can say it. Sometimes it doesn't mean a reduction of staff deaths. Sometimes it doesn't mean addition of staff deaths. It's absolutely true. It's kind of both. It's just looking at it from the standpoint of let's analyze it. Let's see what makes sense. Let's see what's good for our kids. And we kind of work from there. But it does make a difference in negotiation. Um, these are the proposed uh, expenditure changes. These are the major categories that you would get there. So it shouldn't be a surprise, the salary category. And again, the first column there is the March. So that was the March budget adjustment that you approved. It's the latest 16, 17 budget I have. And then there's the one we're going to propose for 17, 18. And right at the top, second column over. And what you see there is salaries are up about uh, 600,000. You put the 1% in there, some of the other things we did. That's kind of where I'd expect it. You might wonder why the benefits are down just shy of a million, if you remember. And that benefits category would be the early retirement incentive, which was in our budget this year, about 900,000. So that's what happened. The benefits really just kind of remain stable. Um, but when that comes out of it, there's going to be a drop in that part of it. Purchase services um, and contracted services, about the same. Uh, you know, those are anything that we purchase from somebody that's not on our payroll. So picture everything we have to hire out to do. Contractor services a little more on the repair and maintenance size, but they're all the same general category. Uh, I would guess the majority of those two are due to BioClean. The contractor's up a little bit. Couldn't be all of it. It could be everything from, um, we might have, and I know we did. We chopped down more trees because of the uh, ash, or that all of a sudden we were, we were doing quite a few there to, to be safe. So that was there. Um, supplies and materials, remember what I said? It's pretty much uh, staying the same down a little bit there. Could be various reasons there. Um, I think on the, the capital outlay, a little bit of seeing the bonds effect there. There's less to take out of the general fund. Not that we still don't because, for example, this summer, you know, we're doing, um, for example, bathrooms. And so it had to come from someplace. And so that would be our capital fund. But you're starting to see some of the bond effect of there's another source to take care of some of those capital outlays. Uh, leases, uh, kind of an impressive amount, but that's the copier lease. So the copier lease finally goes away. We're going to buy them through the bond now because that takes that lease was there every year over and over again. That really helps offset some of the increases that we had this year. And the transfers, uh, again, are just various things with the money's going out of the system. So again, you'll see that our, our expenditures are down about 776000 So general fund, and again, this is by account um, at $78 million. Um, like I said, down about 776000 you can see where everything goes. I think the key thing, and this doesn't change much, we're uh, a personnel heavy uh, field uh, business. And you'll see, if you look at it pretty closely, somewhere between 85 and 86% of our uh, um, expenditures are typically on personnel of some kind. Um, you'll see the other there, the 14.5, that hasn't changed much. Uh, maybe a little higher when you have a little older staff, but it's sometimes more experienced staff. But um, it sticks right around there, so it's pretty close to being the same. Another way to look at that exact same thing, so I try to give you a couple. This one's by function. Sometimes I know you guys are interested in just a different look to say, okay, so where's where's the money going? So you can look up here and say, okay, 65% is class instruction, student support, instructional support. Um, you can see the other or the administration, how much it is. Support services tend to be like the financial business office, tech people, uh, those things. So you can see where they go, maintenance, transportation, athletics. Uh, but just a different look at where the expenditures go when you see the list of expenditures. And one of the things you got in the board packet was kind of like a, a chart, if you will, that kind of showed you the different categories and the different functions. You could see where the different amount of money is going. But it's just two ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you're always interested in the, the bottom line. So when we propose the budget, where are we going? Um, again, that's in the first column, that's the March budget. So what you're looking at is that 16 17 adjusted budget. Uh, not our final ones, so whenever we start talking fund balance, i got to question you. I won't know the exact fund balance until I see that last audited number, so we know exactly what it is. So this is a guess where you think it will be. But when you look at this then, you'll see where the revenues were at the different times. Now again, if you look at it, you can see the two numbers I talked about on the revenues and expenditures. Uh, in both cases, we expect, and I know it had been a while last year, you hadn't seen it for a while, but we expect ex excess as revenues, in other words, we certainly are staying within what we're taking in within that year and not having to touch fund balance. Um, there is a category called budget variance. Uh, that can either go up or down. 
Um, and it could be either like an increase in revenue or a decrease in expenditures or increase in expenditures. I mean, there's variance takes all over. One percent. I think I've told you many times historically it runs two to three percent. It's more close to two in the last few years as money's gotten tighter. But we budget one to be conservative. I don't want anyone thinking, you know, we're not trying to, if it's, when it's there at the end, we'll show it to you. But this is what we try to budget for. So you can see the surplus, if you will, and the money that we'll be able to put into fund balance uh, is about 1.6, 1.7 million there. Um, so again, you get excess revenue. You'll have some variance that will go in. Um, what I put there is the unrestricted fund balance. There's fund balance. That's everything that's above and beyond, right? Um, within fund balance, there is what we call inventory and prepaid items. Money's gone. You can't spend it, but it's part of fund balance. So if someone gives you just the fund balance number, that's in there. The other thing that's in there is anything that was, I'll call it gifts or restricted money. Restricted money has a purpose. You can only use it for that purpose. So what I tried to show you this time was the unrestricted. Sometimes when you look at the budget document, you also see spendable. That's another term you see, spendable fund balance. Well, the spendable includes all the gift money because you can spend it. You just can't spend it on anything you want to. So just throwing that out there. So unrestricted wise, looks uh, if our projections come in, somewhere around 11.8 to 11.9 uh, uh, million. Uh, and you can see, because the curious part is always the percent of expenditures. Now as we do that, and it's always debatable, and we always talk to people about how much should you have in your, your fund balance. Um, and it's always, you know, it depends who you are, what you think is the right number. Uh, almost every one of our employee groups, can't think of one that hasn't, have all agreed to look at next year, not actually the year after, 1819, uh, any kind of raise is going to be based on how much we have in fund balance. So uh, I think Mike has presented to those groups and, and myself when we've talked to them that we would like a fund balance somewhere between this 13 and uh, 15 or 16. And you know, when people ask me, do you really need that, I would just always tell people that when you look at it, and maybe I can show you by uh, jump to a trend there. If you look at this, just so you can see a trend and the reason it's important, you know, if you look there, there's a lot of years that little blue line is not as high as the orange one, except for the last three. All those times you were, and it's okay. That's why you put together a fund balance so that you can allocate when you need to. But that's what got you through. So before my time in this position, you use that funds balance to make it through. I don't know if there's a magic number either, and if you go around, it's around the state, it's different in every community. I'm just telling you that that, that got you through, uh, as you look at it, there's a good five years up there where you had to use it. There's a couple years, like 10, 11, you might say, oh, we were okay then. That was a big influx, one-time payment kind of thing. Yeah, we made it, but didn't know we were going to. And even as late as uh, 15, 16, um, excuse me, 14, 15 would be the first time, we thought we were going to dip in further than we did. And in 15, 16, we ended up being to the good, but much bigger to the good. So I just wanted to show you that. Uh, another way you might look at it is, is kind of over trends. And so I would just say, as you look at that, again, you'll see that we were really taking her down pretty low there. And percentage-wise, we're working our way up. That's true fund balance there. That's not unrestricted one. So both graphs are just showing you how much we have in fund balance. So as you look at that, um, what I would just tell you is it's, a, it's been a savior as we've looked at things. And it's helped us make it through to that point. And so as you look ahead, I'm not going to tell you you're not ever going to dip into that because you're not going to build that to 50% and say, oh, this is great. But you, you got to have some, some money there for lots of different reasons. I look at the budget and see that we're still making good progress. We've had, um, I said it earlier, not just the people that put together the budget, but all our employees to this time have worked really hard um, and helped us by the concessions they've made, um, hard work they do. Uh, it's not just the process, but it's, it's getting there. So I always look at that as kind of a total team effort. So. That's the budget. I certainly would answer any questions for you. You know, you have to follow with the public hearing and the budget. But all right, so at this time, we'll move into um, item 3.4, which is a public hearing of the 2017-18 general operating budget. So do I have questions for Bob, comments? I guess one thing, um, Bob, you talked about the taxes, and we're at 2.72. Now that's split, right, for summer taxes? Yes, for we the do one folks. point. If in the city of In the city. city. That would be split. The okay. county only uh, assesses once in the winter, so that doesn't get split. So, yeah, it would be one point. Uh, in fact, summer tax resolution coming up here will say 1.36. We'll split that. Hold harmless gets split too, but we try not to do that equally because it's like 
playing with fire that's we typically take like 0.9 and then we follow up with whatever the remainder is it's too tough to predict because sometimes if i can get a better read like we suddenly know we have more students in august before september i can adjust a little bit more maybe a little closer but we've been pretty accurate here lately. okay and then with the 31a that um if we do get the 525,000, then we'll probably see changes in the school improvement plan and different things we'll, we'll be able to invest differently yeah and i would caution you too far on that you know brian and i will differ just a little here and so i'm a little more cautious and conservative brian's very excited about that money where you can close the achievement gap and some of the things he can do there and <laughs> i'm still not sold that bob's correct on the 525,000. that's why he put did not put a figure in there right right um i think there's some still some things going on in lansing that makes me very cautious of that and so I hear the other way. I also know that there's many new things tie barred to that language. So at one time at risk money, um, when I was the previous district, um, was pretty much I could use it wherever I chose. That's not the case. If you look how the new language is tied to the third grade reading legislation, to the math legislation, and some improvement goals, some restrictions. And so um, I think some of the things that Brian and the principals have talked about may not meet these guidelines, but we'll wait and see where the proof of pudding is once it's officially approved. That part, Brian, would agree on. Well, I'm excited that there's a, a chance that we'll get that money, and, and yeah. I think it'll it'll make a huge difference for yeah. that. Risk and let me go back a little bit just about that at-risk fund. So that payment I talked about earlier to the Equity Caucus, they have worked very hard on that. But also, um, since I've been here, I've raised probably a little bit of cane with our two local representatives about at-risk kids and at-risk kids. And I give Gary Glenn credit. He, he has gone into Lansing and been our um, advocate on that, that, you know, minimum public schools may have less at-risk kids, but they still have at-risk kids, and that money should follow at risk. And so they, the present language only allows us to capture a portion of that. Bob knows his numbers better than me. So a typical district that's not one of the 32 districts will get a 500? 700. And we and we are under the new language. So we got our foot in, but under the new language, we would get thirty percent. Thirty percent. Thirty percent. Only thirty percent. So we get thirty cents on a dollar compared to every other district right. gets a dollar. So we're making progress. Mm -hmm. But we just can't, we've got, we still got some to go. work to do. Mm -hmm. I guess the other uh, thing that I noticed was with the idea IDEA flow through um, services through the ESA and the sixty six thousand dollars that we're getting this year and haven't gotten from years so Lori a big thank you yes. for for helping us uh, uncover that and um, <coughs> it's I, I would love to have the definition of flow through when for 20 years we haven't seen the flow through so um, I'm, I'm glad to see that 66,000 coming through yeah in all honesty fortune shares we got into it and if you Lori would agree it, it's you have federal regulations and you have state regulations and in some cases it's not clear which one was. So I think part of it was this conflict of the two areas and nobody really knowing who interpreting what. So it starts with who even is the local education agency. In some cases in the state, the ISD can act as that, in other cases it's us all the way. So I think that's where some of that difficulty came from. But I will give Lori, Lori, Bob, Mary Lauer's a ton of credit on that one that they dug deal, so deep and they went to MDA and got a definition of that LEA, which hence may give us the ability to go to the ESA and say it is not right. And that is 66,000 multiplied by many years potentially, so that's a big, big time. Absolutely. Um, I was excited, of course, with the uh, employee groups set all settling and then the 1% raises. And then I, I sure hope we can we can hit the 15% fund uh, general fund balance because that would even that would be a 1% raise for next year and that would be um, great for the employee groups as well. There, there comments. I, I, I think yeah, you I look just, like you're. I just want to say thank you um, to Lori and Bob and anybody else who was involved. The graphs, the charts. Um, it made it understandable to me for my first time through, um, so I appreciate that. And I would like to comment that after the years, it's so nice to see the fund balance increasing after so many years of watching it decrease. And we needed to use it for very important reasons, but 
it's just kind of refreshing to see that. Um, I think it's time and, and that our uh, budget is looking good. Healthy. And healthy, yep, so that we can share that, hopefully, with, with our employees. So thank you for all your hard work, everyone. <coughs> Anyone else? I guess I feel it's just fiscally responsible when you have 15% fund balance to be able to give raises and talk about raises, but uh, when, when you don't have that healthy fund balance, it, it makes it a real hard, uh, a hard sell and you put your district at risk. So um, I'm just pleased with that, that budget. Did you have something? Yeah, I was just you curious. Like you were <laughs> I was waiting. For yes. <laughs> um, all the tables are great. I just on Appendix D, we have the ratio of students per certified staff and students per teacher, and then we have students per administrator. And there was some moves in the students per administrator, and I was just curious if there's a target that we were going after to that is a rule of thumb that we should think, be in. No, I think the reason you see that, course, in a graph guy. Um, one of the things is we took the administrators pretty low, so it's kind of a false, um, if you will, the number, so the graph jumped up, the number of students per administrator jumped up because we took the number of administrators, so uh, kind of when we talked about adjusted staff, at the end of that year, you know, it's like when you get one of those moments, you go, I think we pushed that one a little too far, mm -hmm. and that was uh, a actually people in the building too, so you're getting feedback going, oh, you got that tight enough that made this hard. And so it's really been us getting back to where I want to tell you. One Bob's being politically correct, Brad. <laughs> I, by nature, I'm very aggressive, and I came in and I did. That first two months on the job where Linda walked in and said we were 80 students missing, and I had to find 800,000 and already a declining budget. Bob's not kidding. I wondered what I had done. And so I, that next year, I went extremely aggressive. And Mary was still out in high school. She knows what I did to the high schools and what I did to places. And as that budget began to recover, I self-reflected and say, where can we do that? And we added some back, but we didn't add it the same. And so, I, you know, I, I feel like we're a changing organization. And so those who want, the, we look like exactly what we once were, um, we're not going to look exactly what we once were. We're, we're a different population, a different organization. And so we went to the principals to say, we, we're going to give some FTE back decide how you're going to use that FTE, but it's not going to be exactly the same. Then central office, you know, I, I, um, many U.S. board members tried to talk me out of it. We didn't fill Gary Verlini's position, um, and I certainly, and I'll give credit to Brian and Bob in this because I was supposed to be equally sharing in the extra duties and pains, but they're very good at protecting me, and they took the bulk of that work on, and, um, you know, when I see my two colleagues here at 6 in the morning and 7 at night, and, um, and, and what we're doing, and too thin, and so again, as we recover, it's a chance to reflect and move back. The teacher ratio of the student it is, I don't know how to say this one nicely, I honestly believe there was times that, um, I'll say it this way, so um, when I lived poor as a young man, I knew I didn't waste money. Today that I make a little more, I probably at times waste the money because I have it. Our district, at times, had the luxury of, of spending money it's more than money than they should have, probably. And so I watch staffing closer than probably anybody has had, and sometimes that's comfortable for people, but we run staffing tighter and closer. But again, when you look at our class size numbers, they're not um, accessible, really even maybe increased across the board, but we no longer have a class. We used to see often in our, in our classes, particularly secondary level, where maybe we ran a 15 student section and then we ran a 32. Where now it's more we're moving to that 20 to, to you know, maybe 30 range. And so the, the average is still the same, but we've increased the bottom if that makes sense. And so we're just tightening the organization. So yeah, you're seeing that in that graph. I think multiple, like most things, Brad, multiple reasons. Yeah, there's not a lot of fluctuation in the students per yeah. If that one's consistent all the way back to 2003. Yes, and, and we've kept it there, mm -hmm. down there, yeah. If you look back to 2003, that's the point of the days we had 60 administrators. Mm -hmm. So that was so little, we're not anywhere near that. Uh, half that, that would be it. Yeah, that table's pretty empty over yeah. there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I just had one more I was going to say, that's, yep, go ahead. Um, so is this reflective of what we did 20 minutes ago? We hired another administrator, is that in here? 
Is it in? Yes. Oh. Yes. Janet yes. Be because this is the yeah. budget moving forward. So yeah. this is next year's budget. So, yeah. so like all the budgets that we do, uh, not, again, not knowing exactly where things will end up, we have that some assumption. So the assumption is, OK, this administrative appointment's going to happen, so we put it in the budget. Uh, just like anything else, we get down the road and something doesn't happen, that's why we have adjustments to reflect what we're doing. So it's, it's in there. We tried to have a contingency. It's interesting where I think the last city the uh, Marquesian told me 20 new hires. That sound right, Mike? Yeah. Okay. And so we got to project their salaries. Uh, we tend to be conservative, meaning uh, we put a lot of them, uh, you know, yeah, we know we're going to get one ones as we call them, category one, step ones. But there are categories where you're not going to find anybody in that. So we try to err on the side of the higher salaries. So it's built in there so you don't have to worry about, oh boy, we had to get this person. Is that going to same with the benefits side. Yeah. If that makes sense to you, we put them in like full family just because, you know, if they come in as a single and many one ones will, that's okay. We are we high, have that money but it's yet. close. We are high. You've seen enough of these budgets. We are high on an adopted budget. Mm -hmm. Don't ever want to come to you and say we built the budget too small. Right. We'd rather do it the other way around. Well, and I think that that's one of the things I wanted to point out that I've still been impressed with year after year is that we still have this budget variance that we come out with. And I know a few years ago when things were really not looking well and we were really tightening, the question was, okay, can we still assume that we're going to have the same type of budget variances? And we still yeah. seem to have as credit to everybody in the district. And you're on a nice tight variance meeting. Uh, math and science people it's you know it's in the same range every year right and it's a reasonable range and you don't have the highs and the, and the lows which is, is a good way to be you can kind of almost predict what your variance mm -hmm. can be um, you know so Bob, Bob's always cautious but he'll tell you you know it ranges two to three and right. it's a nice variance um, Lori and I've seen many districts that are just consistently higher than that and that almost is like um, maybe not lack of work of putting in and tightening that but that budget just first one you do in the year is also the tightening that to get that variance to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. my, uh, my statement often to when we're administrative meetings is they'll say, but I give you money back. And I said, that's the variance I got to have. That's, we expect the variance. You know, if right, we, right. If we're not going to get that. That's a different way to budget. Then. You know, the, the goal is not to spend every cent that you get. Mm -hmm. you have enough to do what you want to, and if you don't spend it, we want it back. Um, and then it goes to fund balance or to fund something else. And, some other area, and that happens at times where, that as we're finishing accounts up at the end of the year, you, you need and it's something that's not avoidable, but we have some variants over here that we can use over there. Okay, excellent. Yes, and the fund violence also, like other people have commented, is trending upward, but I once again, as I say every year, cautiously optimistic because we all know it was only two years ago, I think, that we. About sat pay. here in June thinking we were going to have to budget in September because the key thing in September is that we don't get a state aid payment. So we need to have that fund balance just to bridge that gap. Yep. So, all right. Are there other comments? i going to open up the public. If there's any. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak, comment? Anyone? <laughs> They're racing up. All right, all right, well thank you.